Hello, good evening, Ash in London here again with uh, another top 10 and uh, a slightly different top 10 today. Um, an interesting one, hopefully. I hope you find this interesting. It's all about um, influential music, but influential music that wasn't considered that great at the time, if you know what I mean. Uh, it's mostly albums, albums that were released that are now considered classics uh, and also very influential on, on music in general. But uh, basically didn't sell much or weren't as successful as expected at the time. Um, so um, it's a subject that's been covered many times. There are, there are other other um, videos around on YouTube and in various places in books and all kinds of things. So it's nothing. It's nothing new. This is just just my my take on it really. Um, there's some of the usual suspects here, uh, of course. But um, the, only, the only thing that really connects them with me is that uh, I actually like them. I actually like like these pieces of music and uh, and albums. And uh, yeah, so um, I'm not rank I'm not ranking them in any particular way. I'm going to do them in chronological order. There's nine albums and uh, one piece of music, which isn't an album as well. But uh, I just thought I'd throw in something a bit interesting at the beginning to because um, everyone talks about these things being a, a sort of recent thing, you know, like from the '60s onwards. But um, uh, music was music that is considered classic now or influential was um, you know never really took off that big. To start with, um, in, in earlier days, like a, in, if anyone watched my classical channel, um, Elgar's Cello Concerto is a good, good example of that. Uh, not featured here today, though. I've got some different, a different thing to show the same example. But um, anyway, I'm talking too much. Let's get on with this little video. It's um, I, c I couldn't decide a title for this. May have been too long. Um, influential music and classic albums that weren't big at the time. Ten top ten. <laughs> anyway, okay, here we go. Right, uh, number one. We'll start, we're going way back to um, 1913 with this, and uh, it's the Russian composer Stravinsky, Igor Stravinsky, and he did um, um, a ballet, uh, wrote the music for a ballet that was um, premiered in, in 1913 called The Rite of Spring, and I have it on here, so Stravinsky Greatest Hits <laughs> uh, double double CD collection the Great Ballets and there's a few of his on here but yeah now this, this is quite a, a notorious one um, 1913 Stravinsky had had great success with uh, his previous um, ballets for the Firebird and Petrushka and it was all set up to premiere this great new ballet with a um, choreography by Nijinsky uh, what was his first name Vaz, Vazlav was it Nijinsky and it was going to be on at the newly opened um, Champs Elysees, the Theatre of the Champs Elysees, and it was great fanfare. I mean, there was a early performance um, to the press, I think, that went without incident. But um, then the main premiere, the place was absolutely packed to the gills, uh, great expectation all round, and it was a bit of a bit of a riot. Apparently, I think it's been slightly exaggerated over the years about how bad a riot it was. Um, there was a film. Uh, um, Karl Stravinsky and Coco Chanel, where I think the start of the film features that. He, um, that's their their take on it. Depends on who you who you read. I mean, who whoever did the um, who wrote about it, and and the the um, the target was always a bit vague. Was it the music or was it the choreography that was um, that was the problem? But so we'll never know. Uh, it's. Uh, Premiered in London as well. They did a, a short tour, um, a few dates in London, but that went kind of without incident. But it just wasn't really, it didn't really take off at all. And then, of course, World War, World War One started, the Great War started, and that put a hold on lots of things like this, lots of creativity. And then um, in between the wars, it kind of picked up momentum a bit more. It was actually featured in Disney's Fantasia film, um, in the, if you remember the dinosaur segment in that. So um, it did pick up momentum, but it wasn't really until later on, like the 80s, um, that it became this, the classic it is seen as now. And it's now seen as one of the greatest achievements in 20th century music, uh, Right of Spring. It is a, it is an unusual piece, I must admit. It's very, a very contemporary piece. It's a million miles away from Beethoven or Tchaikovsky, but um, there you go. So um, that was a, a piece of music that didn't take off straight away. A bit of a disaster at its premiere, but he's now considered one of the greatest pieces of music uh, of all time. Of all time, it's the Rise of Spring by uh, Stravinsky. Okay, now moving slightly on in the time machine to the nineteen fifties. 
1959, in fact. And this one, um, I'll explain why I've got this in it. It's Miles Davis, kind of blue. Now, the label says, Jazz Masterpiece, perhaps the most influential and best-selling jazz record ever made. Which it is, of course, it's, uh, everyone knows about this now. Um, it probably is the biggest-selling jazz album ever. And that's the thing with this. It was it was big in the jam. I mean, Miles Davis was been around for quite a while already in 1959 and um, released this to great acclaim, critical acclaim. It didn't make, um, I think it made number 10 in the jazz charts in the States, didn't chart at all in the UK. And didn't chart at all in the main in the main in the main um, records chart like the the, the Billboard two hundred or whatever whatever it is down in the, in the states, and I think that's what it because okay so okay all very well being a big in the jazz world, but this has, has influenced music beyond there it's, it's influenced loads of people outside the jazz world and that that's why that's why I'm surprised it didn't take off more in in the in the music world in general. Um, the first I heard about him, I mean, I'd, I'd never heard of Miles Davis when I was a teenager until I read an interview with the Electric Light Orchestra and uh, they were being asked about their influences. Obviously the Beatles were mentioned and uh, I think it was the cellists actually uh, and Mick Kaminsky, the violinist, said, oh, said, oh, Miles Davis, great, a big influence and I was reading this interview, oh, who, who the hell's Miles Davis? So I investigated, came across an album called um, Birth of the Cool which was uh, interesting. I thought, oh, this is okay, it's just jazz. You know, I, knew, I, knew, I knew a lot about jazz because my, my family were into it and um, uh, so you know, jazz was always around. But it wasn't, well, I heard this quite a bit later, kind of blue, and then I thought, oh yeah, I can see that. It's um, pretty pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. And it's has since become, you know, it's, it's, I'd say it's a big seller. Everyone knows about it, but it wasn't really huge in the wide world, it was just uh, big in the in the jazz world, and I think that's why I thought it deserves inclusion here because lots of um, other genres have cited Miles Davis and this album in particular as a great influence. So um, it is a classic, I must admit, it's a, a jazz classic, but it, it should be an in general classic. I, I liken it to Bob Marley, where Bob Marley, okay, was bit big in the reggae world, but he also appealed to people who weren't necessarily into reggae, if you know what I mean. So. Outside the world of jazz, this is a, considered a classic, but it wasn't huge outside the world of jazz at the time. And it's uh, the second instalment on uh, my little top ten here. Okay, right. Right, my next two albums, in fact, here are um, contenders for the uh, most influential albums ever. Um, these are quite quite common in lots of lists. First one came out in 1966, and he's no introduction. It's the Beach Boys, Pet Sounds. Now um, you may be surprised this is on this list as a as a poor a poor seller. It wasn't a poor seller as such, but it wasn't as big as um, uh, they they expected because the Beach Boys were huge, particularly in the states. As uh, this fun loving, uh, clean cut, all American boy band, probably the original boy band, singing about surfing, girls, and hot rods, and that kind of down on the beach in California. And uh, when this this came out, I think obviously inspired by the Beatles, the Beatles had released Rubber Soul. And uh, that kind of inspired Brian Wilson to do something a bit more adult, a bit more album orientated, because they're a big singles band. I mean, they, they did well in the album market as well. So he um, put this together and was big on the production side of it, the songwriting. And um, it is a, an absolute masterpiece when you think about when it was recorded and the, the, the creativity that went into it. And it has inspired many, many people, uh, from the Beatles to the Pixies. To to everyone really, as, as um, I mean, I think Rolling Stone has, has quite often be, has been um, cited as the best best record ever released. I'll, I'm not quite sure it goes as far as that, but it's de definitely it is a great album. Um, it is something that um, I mean, the Beach Boys rolls around. One of my cousins was a big Beach Boys fan, so during the six, I knew, I knew a lot about it. I remember hearing this album at the time. I remember seeing her in her, in, her, in her collection. And that, now, who was it that said? Someone came out with a great line about this because um, I forgot who the hell it was. Uh, someone said uh, that so many rock bands took pet sounds as the green light to get clever. So it's when it kind of stopped being entertainment, became an art form in, in many ways. Um, the interesting thing about it, it got mixed reviews at the time, funnily enough. I mean, some great, you know, because there's a lot of good stuff on it. There's, like, there's a, you know, some one or two classic um, Beach Boys songs on here. But it never really was a big seller. It made, I think it made the top ten just about in the states. It was bigger in the UK. It got to number two in the UK, but it didn't really you know, sell the huge amounts they were expecting. Um, 
But um, I've never been quite sure about colour. Actually, you may have noticed um, the yellow is missing because uh, it's. Um, this was a later release. This was a, uh, a remaster from the eighties, and um, the Beach Boys' Pet Sounds. Uh, the Beach Boys' name is, is in yellow, and some of the album tracks in yellow as well. So it's missing that off. I don't know. I don't know why we dropped it on this. It was, this was in the UK, and there was only this this version that's done that thing. I don't know what that makes it a collectible item or not. Uh, the picture there was taken at uh, San Diego Zoo. Can't remember the name of the photographer, but there, there are some great tracks. Wouldn't it be nice? There's the, the side one opener, which uh, Paul McCartney actually says uh, he thinks the best song ever written. Then you've got uh, the other big hits on here. You've got uh, God Only Knows, so open side two, uh, Sloop John B, which is the old Caribbean folk song, which they uh, did a variation of. But yeah, some some great 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 songs. It's about the production. It's being called a musician's album or a producer's album because it's just the, the way it's been densely produced and the different techniques used. You've got the wall of sound uh, thing coming in here, lots of different instruments, kind of baroque sounds coming in, harpsichords, all, all kinds of different uh, arrangements. And uh, it, it, it was quite an achievement. Um, it uh, ruined um, Brian Wilson's mental health, I think, in the end. This is where he started his mental decline. Uh, I think the pressure was on, because he, he was a co-writer for most of the stuff. He produced it. He was instigating it. I've got a feeling he was up against um, a lot of objection and, and some of the things he was doing and the, the other thing about this was um it's obviously a beach boys album but the beach boys don't feature that prominently as musicians they they do have the, the vocal harmonies but it's um there's a raft of session musicians playing most of the instruments the wrecking crew i think i've mentioned them before that's what they're known as on most of the instruments are played by session musicians so it's not really a, a band uh, you know a band vehicle in in that way but yeah it was um it was just a great, great album, and it's um, it's not worn well with time, to be honest. It does sound a little bit dated now in some of it, but it's, um, it's definitely worth being in, in this list. Um, there's a good track. Actually, the pic, as I said, the Pixies were a big, bigger uh, fan of the um, the Beach Boys, and there's a track on here called "Where Are We?" Uh, I know where. Where is it? I know there's an answer. Track two, track two, side two, which was originally called "Hang On to Your Ego." And uh, the Pixies uh, did a version of that, uh, the original version, Hang On To Your Ego. So um, that, that was then. I think it was only one of those compilations where bands cover Beach Boys. Um, I can't remember. I should to research that, but I haven't. But um, anyway, there you go. It's um, Beach Boys. Now, I've got another bit of Beach Boys stuff to show you here, another prop. Uh, but it's, uh, that's been re-released and remastered so many times. But the one I've got is the 40-year anniversary, which came out in... Um, when did it come out? Forgotten. Oh, I've forgotten the dates on here somewhere. Two thousand and six. Of course, I've shown children the math, shouldn't I? Sixty-six, sixty-six, two thousand six. And they see the original yellow on the uh, on the, uh, the album there in the um, Cooper Black typeface. And this was good because what you got here was the, that remastered version. I don't find it was a stereo remaster. You got CD disc here with the, um, the original mono program uh, remastered. Uh, with the bonus track being the Hang On, Hang on To Your Ego version of um, I Know There's An Answer. And there's a bonus DVD on here, that's a second disc, uh, it was a uh, documentary, The Making of Pet Sounds, and you've got lots of um, other uh, audio mixes on here, high-res Dolby mixes, and uh, so that, that, that was a... If you're, not, if you're not wanting to spend too much on one of these huge box sets with lots of different outtakes and things, I'd recommend that one, the 40th anniversary two disc version so that's uh, Pet Sounds the third instalment on this top ten and um, going for moving on a year to 1967 to the other contender uh, the, the most influential um, album released and it's The Velvet Underground Velvet Underground and Nico like I say 1967 and um, yeah this um, Interesting. I um, mean, this this is this is the one. This is probably I'd say it's probably slightly better. Than the, this one hasn't worn uh, has worn better with time. Uh, you can still hit, listen to this and think, God, that could have been released last year. Because I think this had a broader reach. Of the who influenced it influenced more of the musicians and the bands. I think more than anything. Most notably, David Bowie actually. And um, the people have said if David Bowie hadn't heard this, he would have carried on just being a, a hippie folk singer. But uh, kind of changed his the course of his career. And, uh, of course, later on he thanked uh, Lou Reed for that uh, by um, helping him in the 70s uh, rekindle his career when he um, helped him with his um, Transformer album. So 
There you go. Now this, this was interesting. It came out. Of course, this came out in the summer of love. So uh, one of the reasons why this probably wasn't a big seller at the time. I've, there's room. There's numbers going around. Though. One of the numbers I've heard is it only sold ten thousand copies when it came out. Um, because okay, summer of love, and they were singing about all these dark things like uh, drug addiction, sadomasochism, and um, all kinds of things. Obviously, all these kind of little dark stuff. And um, I just don't think it kind of like caught the imagination of all the the flower people. Everyone was going to San Francisco with uh, flowers in their hair, not New York City with bananas in their hair. But um, yeah, and of course the Andy Warhol connection is quite prominent there. Andy Warhol designed the sleeve. He was he was their manager, and uh, I think he was co-producer on this as well. Yeah, produced well, he produced it as well. So he had a lot of control over it, which I think um, may may have held them back a bit. Another thing that I think may have held this back was uh, the fact it was actually released on the Verve record label which is a jazz label so I've often wondered whether or um, they, they, they didn't have the machinations in, in, in you know set in motion to promote this to uh, worldwide you know that outside the jazz world if you know what I mean and that, that could have been uh, one of the issues but uh, it has it has kind of um, over the years of course built this um, notoriety as being this legendary album and, and, and rightly so because it is a superb album um, all the songs written by Lou Reed, pretty much. Um, Sunday morning, waiting for the man, Femme Fatale, Vinish and Furs. You got Nico on here as well. She's uh, not in the band, but um, guesting on some of the songs. Heroin, European song, the Black Angels Death song, and this is a cool. I mean, the sleeve. I mean, apart from the Warhol front, you got these spread there. They look so cool. I mean, they 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 could have been taken yesterday. Some of those photographs, you know, the way they're looking, that lovely kind of a. Pink Floyd esque kind of stage show thing there, but uh, it, it is a great album. And now there's a, there's a famous another phrase about the um, this album where when I say I think it sold about ten thousand copies at the time. Now and some and now I don't know who said this. Lots of people have claimed that they said this. Eno is one of them. He's the most, most prominent one saying this. So of of those ten thousand copies, everyone that bought a copy formed a band. That that's the uh, that's the line that goes out there, which um, could be true. I don't know, but there are a lot of um, bands that do owe a great debt to, to this album, Velvet Underground. Really, it's definitely their best album. Um, there's a I love that also on the album. You have this thing where you can peel the band. I've been, I've never actually done it. Cause I was too scared it might either rip. Or uh, won't be able to get it back on again. So um, it's fairly, fairly well intact at the moment. But anyway, yeah. So there you go. So it inspired all the in, lots of the indie bands, uh, the shoegaze bands. You know, every, everyone, like I say, Bowie and anyone that came after. I, mean, I think a lot of bands owe a debt to, the, to this, this album and the Velvet Underground in general. So there we go. Uh, the fourth instalment on his ten is uh, Velvet Underground and Nico from '67. Right, now my next one's a 67 also. Um, I'm not quite sure what time of year whether this came out at the same time. I mean, they both came out in 67. And this, kind of, this, is, um, this is from the West Coast. Uh, the band is Love, and the album is Forever Changes. Uh, now, I got into this album, I don't know if you remember, I did a, a um, rock music book ranking the, um, the other week, and um, I bought this book in 1976 called... Um, New Musical Express Encyclopedia of Rock and it introduced me to lots of new bands and this was one of them I remember seeing because it, it had a picture of the album in there and I kind of got into it and I also found out I was, of course I was into Led Zeppelin at the time and uh, this was one of Robert Plant's favourite albums and I remember him waxing lyrical about it once and I thought oh, I've got to investigate this band and um, that was really really good they, this was their third release and uh, they'd gone a bit more psychedelic and, uh, and mellower um, a, bit, a bit, bit folkier perhaps uh, with a bit of orchestration so they kind of changed the dynamic a bit and it, um, it wasn't a total flop I think it made number 24 in the UK but in the US it only made the, the top 200 just about and then disappeared forever but uh, since being you know, one of those 5 star classics if you read any reviews about it it'll appear, it'll appear in loads of top 10s and um, I, did, I did buy a book an encyclopedia of a um, book a bit later and uh, the, the star rated lots of the albums in there. And this was one of the uh, ones from the sixties that had a five star in that. I think it was the Virgin Book of Rock or something. But it, but it is great. It's got two of their best known songs on here: "Alone Again" or and what's the other one? Da, da, da. And more again. Those were two. Um, I think they were both singles. On there. But um, it was yes, just a, just a great, great album because Albert Lee was the the guy who was the uh, 
the man in charge here. I've got a feeling this was the last of this lineup. Um, I can't quite remember. I didn't really. You know, obviously, it was before my time. So, you know, I, was, I didn't really get into this until the seventies. But yeah, definitely um, worthy of a, a position on the on this list. One of the classics that uh, didn't sell much at the time. I have to do something about the title. <laughs> uh, it's Love Forever Changes from 1967. Okay, right, going over back over, on over the pond now to the UK. This is the first British one on here actually. Uh, now the Kinks were one of the. Uh, Top bands of the 60s. Everyone uh, everyone says, oh, Ray Davis had the fourth best band in the 60s. Uh, and I'm not quite sure. I mean, Rolling Stones, Beatles, who were the third? The Who, maybe? I don't know. But um, they were brilliant. They were part of the British invasion. They did really well in America in the early days, but then got banned from the States. And there's never been a, um, an explanation fully about what that was all about. Uh, their rowdy behaviour on stage w was was used as an excuse, but I've got a feeling that um, by the time the Kinks came along, America was sick of all these uh, British bands coming over there, basically bringing on American style music because uh, the Kinks were like the Stones and the Beatles, doing lots of American covers and lots of original material that was very much influenced by that. Um, so you know, the Kinks they uh, got banned from America for quite a few years. So they were, ended up back in the UK and they got got a bit more introspective and it kind of, it kind of boosted Ray Davis. Uh, he probably thought, oh, forget about all that rock and roll stuff. I'm going to write about England. And started off with an album called, it was Face to Face, and then another one called um, Something Else by the Kinks, which kind of like was that morph, they were morphing away from the rock and roll sound to a more pastoral kind of English sound. And then in 1968, they released this. The Kinks are the Village Green Preservation Society. And um, it was a complete disaster. It failed to chart, I think, anywhere. And there was no singles off it, which didn't help, because the 60s was all very singles-motivated. Uh, there was a single out at the time called Days, which is actually featured on here, the, the, obviously with these remasters you get on the track, which is a great song. That made the charts. Uh, it was later made famous by Kirsty McCall. But it uh, um, not been on the album. People probably looking at the album, oh, it's got no singles on, so I'm not going to buy that. But um, yeah, this was brilliant, and this has since become um, really, really um, influential, and particularly with the Britpop era. Britpop was seen as like harking back to this type of music, you know, where he started singing the, the title track, Village Green Preservation Society, Do You Remember Walter, Picture Book, Johnny, there's some, some great, great songs in here. It's really, really um, Ray Davis at his best. He's a he's sole songwriter, I think. On um, on the whole album, really, but um, it was just really, just really, really good album. I never heard it at the time. I've heard it more, you know, in later years. I'd say Blur were probably the the closest to this kind of um, sound and influence uh, during the Brit Brit pop sound. Oasis uh, came more from the Beatles side. Blur um, came from um, the Kinks. Um, um, so yeah, it was just great and it's just amazing how it just completely failed to charge. It got positive critical reviews at the time and um, I think just singing about England instead of America was um, the way to go. Although, in the, in the opening line, um, or, in the, or one of the opening verses I think it is, he talks about uh, British icons and English icons and mentions Donald Duck. Now, call me, I don't know, I'm not quite sure. I mean, Donald Duck's American, isn't he? Is that right? I don't know. Maybe he's thinking of someone else. But anyway, brilliant album. And um, if no one's ever heard it properly, I'd recommend go out and listen to it now. It is uh, fantastic. And um, it was a Kink's sixth album. And it's number six on this little rundown. Okay. Now, where are we going now? Number seven, the seventh entry. This is another band I got into after reading my New Musical Express Encyclopedia of Rock. Uh, this came out in 1970. I bought it not long after, actually. It must have been 77, 78. I've still got it. It's got a bit yellow on the sleeve. It's a spirit, the 12 dreams of Dr. Sargonicus. Sardonicus. Got to get it right. Uh, which is probably their best known album. Um... Uh, the, I heard a track off it. There's a track on it called Nature's Way, which is one of their better known songs. And I, found, I saw that on a uh, compilation album called. Um, damn, what was it called? Can't remember now. Anyway, can't remember. It did. It did get um, five stars in some of the books I've read about, and it got good critical reviews, but didn't really sell. I mean, it was their um, fourth album, 
Uh, the earlier albums are really good as well. I've got those, and they're all really good. Uh, the thing about Spirit is they are um, probably more better known now for being for the legal battle with um, Led Zeppelin over one of their earlier songs called Taurus, which was on the first album, which um, sounds very much like Stay to Heaven. And that was a legal thing that I think has now since been uh, sold. Uh, Randy California, the guy who was in the band at the time, said uh, passed away, so he wasn't involved in um, any of the court cases. But uh, he was the the main reader, uh, lead of the band, main songwriter. So it's quite quite psychedelic still, even though it was seventy. He's still carrying that kind of psychedelic sixties thing going on here. But well, yeah, it was a great album. Uh, Animal Zoo, Morning Will Come, Mr. Skin, some great tracks. It's one of those albums. Um, I, I, to be honest, I wasn't quite too, I wasn't too sure when I first heard it because I'd read about it. Thought, oh, I've got to get that. Bought it. I got it in a second hand shop. And uh, I was like thinking, oh, I'm not too sure about it. I mean, I love Nature's Way because that, that's kind of famous song and I kind of got into that pretty much. But that's the second to last track on side two. So, you know, plough through the rest of it first. But it, it is a really, really good album. The more I listened to it, the more I got into it. And it is, it is deservedly. Class is a classic now, and uh, has earned its place on, on on this little list. Um, kind of a, again, like the Kinks album, it's very much kind of like inspired the indie bands a little bit, maybe a bit proggy as well. Although prog rock was uh, already started up by this point. Although I actually call them a prog rock band, they're more kind of like a bit more psychedelic than that. But um, great, a great listen, a great album, and um, all their albums are good. All their earlier albums, anyway. I'm not quite sure about the later stuff, but. Um, Definitely worth investigating. Spirit, The Twelve Dreams of Dr. Sardonicus from 1970. Okay, so now a bit of um, bit of German music now. Now this was what well, there's a couple of a couple of acts that I remember um, reading about um, from the States. Frank Zappa was one of them, the mother's invention of very, very influential that didn't sell a great deal of albums in the other days. So I do quite like, but they're not in this list. And the other one was Captain Beefheart, which uh, I remember John Peel was always talking about him with his album Trap Mass Replica. So I thought, I'll give that a listen, give it a go. But I just could not get into it at all. I admitted it's been a very influential album, but um, didn't didn't do anything for me at all. But um, alongside those two acts was this band from Germany called Can. Who I did uh, sort of get into. Now, um, there's a magazine. What's the magazine called? Drowned in Sound. It's an online magazine. It's called This the Most Influential Album Ever. I'm not quite sure about that, but this was, you know, um, uh, in its time, this is, uh, you know, sort of like broke all the barriers about uh, song structures and music, music, musicianship and everything. It was their second album, kind of part of that kind of crap rock thing, the Tangerine Dream, Kraftwerk, and all those other German bands. Um, well, this was the first one to feature their J- Japanese vocalist, uh, Damon Suzuki, who they found busking, I think in Berlin or somewhere, or wherever, wherever they were based. And it is an intriguing album. It's a bit hard to get into at first. It's a bit jarring if you're used to kind of normal pop structures and things. A kind of avant funk, crack rock, psychedelic, very experimental. But um, yeah, it's just, just re- really, really good. There's a, I think the shortest track on here is a track called Mushroom. Which is uh, four minutes eight seconds long. It's a dub- double album as well, which made it even harder to get into really originally. But I persevered. I'd, I'd heard, um, I got, I didn't think about it at the time. It's like I said, it was 71. I'd already bought another one of their albums that was a later one, so I was kind of familiar with the sound of them. But um, it was, it is quite interesting to listen to it. Now, the, the, the band that were very much influenced by these is one of my, well, my favorite band, The Fall, and that was another reason I wanted to take that, like, you know try and get into these a little bit more uh, to find out what, what Mark e. Smith was think, was listening when he was here, these kind of things. So the, to the point where he actually did a tribute to Damo Suzuki on the um, Nation Saving Grace album, I Am Damo Suzuki. But uh, you can see you can see where, where he's coming from with this. Uh, I remember an interview with Paul Morley, a uh, music journalist, was saying that with The Fall, when you listen to The Fall, you can see uh, anyone who got into The Fall were probably into Can, Frank Zappa, Captain Beefheart. And uh, listening to the fall with that kind of like background all made sense, or did it? Who knows? I can you can never tell. But um, definitely, definitely worth giving it giving a go. This I think it's um, number eight in the, all these. In the, it's not number eight in the ranking. It's all uh, it's all chronological. It's uh, Tego Mego by Can, uh, the eighth entry in this ten. Okay, moving on, still in, still in the 70s, moving on to 73, and um, this album was one of the biggest influences on the punk 
movement in the uh, late seventies. They were part of the glam scene, uh, kind of a late late comers to the glam scene from New York. It's the New York Dolls, their debut album, self titled, came out in seventy three, and uh, yeah, there you go. Now I got into these. I saw them. I'd heard about them, read about them. I thought, oh gosh, another glam band, looking very androgynous there. A bit, bit. Uh, what's what's the word you'd use for them? A bit sloppy, a bit uh, a bit sleazy, a bit exaggerated. Um, they, uh, I don't know, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, America was a bit different on the glam because the glam thing really kind of started in the UK with that T Rex, Bowie, Slay, that kind of thing, and America had a slightly different approach to it, a bit sleazier. Whereas the glam in the UK was a bit more fun, more about, about the glitter and the colour. Uh, but th- this was interesting. I just, I just loved the sloppiness of them. I saw them. They came up to the UK and I saw them on the old Great Whistle Test TV show. And they played on there. And they were just so like, oh, whatever. They were, compared to the Rolling Stones, like a sort of like slack version of the Rolling Stones, um, in part because uh, David Johansson, the lead singer, he actually looked like a bit like Mick Jagger, sounded a bit like him. There's a lot, some of the styles of the, the songs are a bit like Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones as well. But uh, they had another edge to it as well, a bit like a sort of sleazy, I couldn't care less attitude. And, um, it, and in fact, late, later, a bit like the Happy Mondays somehow, that kind of slack, slacker, kind of lazy-itis kind of thing about, it. well, whatever, I'll just, I'll just do this and then I'll go and get drunk. And I just love that. And that, that was a kind of attitude that uh, really inspired the punk movement, particularly bands like the Ramones and the Dictators as well. I could hear a bit of Dictators in um, in the New York Dolls. Dictators, although they weren't weren't really a punk band as such, but they're kind of part of that New York scene in the uh, late seventies. But uh, I, thought, I thought this was great. And when I got the album, I thought, "Oh, this is great. There's some really good stuff on here." It's got you know, like the opening track, uh, "Personality Crisis," "Looking for a Kiss," and um, was it "Lonely Lonely Planet Boy"? I think. <laughs> First time I've ever heard Lonely Planet before. Uh, there's lots of a track on here, it's pretty good. Um, there's one called Trash, Bad Girl. And uh, now, also, af- after the punk, this is also a big influence on uh, Morrissey and the Smiths. Now, Morrissey was a big fan of New York Dolls. Uh, he stated this is his favourite album ever. And also uh, set up the UK based fan club for the, for the band um, in the, in the um, 70s. I think he actually curated the. Um, Meltdown Festival once and got uh, the surviving members of the New York Dolls to appear. Although I think it was only Johansson left. Although this lineup, I think it was only Johansson left uh, left left alive. So um, it was probably just him and some other band members. But um, you can tell that the Smiths uh, influence on here because the track called Frankenstein, where are Frankenstein, which uh, the structure of it sounds very much like uh, Stop Me If You've Heard This One Before. Off the Strange Ways Here We Come album, very very similar the structure of it, but um, but yeah, it was just um, just a great album actually. It's um, it's one I, I kind of like. So when when I first when I first saw them, I just loved that sleaziness, sloppiness. They just didn't you know they didn't give a shit. You know, it was like you know like we don't care if we're going to be great we're great musicians or not. We're just doing it, and that's it. I think they put more effort into their uh, makeup and. Uh, and nail polish more than anything else. But anyway, there you go. New York Dolls. D- definitely one of the um, uh, most uh, influential albums ever. And it was a really, really poor seller. Sold uh, Probably sold less than the Velvet Underground at the time. But um, much loved nowadays, I think. And uh, good on them. Okay, which comes me to my, to my last entry. That's number nine. And this is the last entry in this, which is already featured in a video of mine. This is from the 80s. And uh, it was featured in my Beastie Boys video. It's Paul's Boutique, which um, if you want to learn more about this and what I say about it, you don't know, find out more on my Beastie Boys album ranking if you haven't already seen it. But yeah, this, um, like I said in that video, it's um, now considered the Sergeant Pepper of hip hop. Uh, it, was, it was just so influential, but was it a big smash at the time? I think after that, because of the previous album, this was their second release. Previous album, of course, licensed to it. Number one in the US, big smash all over the world, hit singles, and uh, this one was just uh, changed labels, gone to Capitol Records, which uh, I don't think was a good fit for them, to be honest. Didn't have any hit singles. They released two singles off it, uh, Hey Ladies and Shadrach. Um, I think Hey Ladies made the lower regions of the top 200. Shadrach didn't go anywhere, and uh, it seemed like it was curtains for the Beastie Boys. I really thought that was it. First album was a great big hit, almost like a novelty. I think I mentioned that in my uh, previous um, Beastie Boys video. 
But um, no, it's now considered an absolute classic. It's probably sold a lot better over the years. Um, I think on CD and uh, hopefully more on vinyl because it's definitely a good time on vinyl. The big fold out sleeve because you'll see the fold out sleeve in my Beastie Boys video. So I'll hold that back from you on this to get you to get to go and look at that video. But yeah, so that, that's my final um, entry in this 10 influential um, albums. Beastie Boys, Paul's Boutique from 1989. So there we go. Right, I think I think hope that made sense. When I was rambling on there, I didn't I didn't didn't make many notes for that. I just made a few um, details of years and things, but <laughs> I just I just rambled on as best I could. So there you go. Those are um, my ten uh, most influential albums and um, well nine influential albums and one influential piece of music. Uh, from many decades so uh, there we go okay so that's that for now uh, i've got a, an idea for the next one which is kind of a con con continuation of this really in some ways so, uh, you'll find out about that in a few more days so um hope you enjoyed that hope you found it interesting uh once again thank you for being there and i'll simply say bye for now